But let's jump into our text in Romans chapter 13. And I want to talk with you about several different things as we're heading into this new year. The holiday season is behind us now. I don't know how many of you could share this uh, experience, but on December 26th, you wouldn't have known that there was a holiday at my house. Everything was put away into its proper place and all the Patriot stuff was restored to its rightful place <laughs> on the mantle and, and all those other places. Um, but uh, that, that's behind us and we're all kind of in a mindset during this time of year of looking ahead and looking forward and anticipation of the next year. We're making plans and we're considering about the things we're going to do differently than we did this past year. The good things we did this past year that we want to continue to do or do even better. And as we contemplate all those things, we should also be in contemplation of our spiritual life and the future of our spiritual life and the future of uh, our time together as a congregation and the plans that we want to have and the efforts that we want to make in this new year to really reach out into this community. And so here in Romans chapter 13, beginning in verse 8, Paul is going to lay out several things. He's been talking about submitting to authorities and having respect to authorities. But then he kind of broadens it out a little bit in verse 8 and following. And he gives us several really helpful principles to take into consideration as we strive to live our lives in such a way that they would be pleasing to God. And he begins with the most simple of principles in the first section, beginning in verse 8. He says, owe nothing to anyone except to love each other for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. We remember in the book of John, of course, that Jesus says, this is the new law that I give to you. You remember this in John, actually John chapter 13 and verse 34, a new law I give to you that you would what church love one another. It's a really interesting statement that Jesus makes because the reality is it's not a new law at all. The idea of love and the idea of looking out for one another and even for one's neighbor is something that goes back to, of all Old Testament books, it goes back to the book of Leviticus. And Jesus draws on that when he talks about the two most important laws, the idea of loving your neighbor as yourself. And so it's the most simplistic, at least on the surface the most simplistic thing that Paul is calling us to, he goes on from there and he says, for the commandments, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. And he, he's giving a sampling from Exodus 19 of the commandments that God had given to his people. And he goes ahead and he covers the rest of them given in the Old Testament. And he says, and any other commandment, are all summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, and therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. What's interesting about these commandments that Paul chooses from among the many he could have selected is that he picks some of the laws that the response to breaking them is a death sentence. The response to committing adultery, you remember in John chapter 8, when the woman is brought to Jesus and they're asking Jesus, what should be done with this one who is caught in adultery? And what they were wanting Jesus to have to say and what they were wanting Jesus to do was to condone the stoning of the woman. And of course, we look at murder and we know that murder carried with it a heavy penalty then and still does today. And many of us, when we want to look at ourselves as, as, as holy and as spiritual people, it's great to be able to say, well, I haven't killed anyone lately. Aren't I good? Or is it ain't I good? One of those, one of those. I'm, I'm losing my English a little bit, I think. Aren't I good? Am I, aren't I a good person? Because I haven't killed anyone. And we can look at those commandments. We say, well, I haven't committed adultery. I haven't stolen anything lately. And I've, I've been watching out over my heart. I, I've been trying not to covet. And we, we go through that list and we can say all the things that we've been doing. But what Paul is really getting to is that love is what is necessary. Now, love sounds really simplistic until you get into this fact. And this is what I want to talk to you about a little bit this morning. True love, love risks. Love risks something. Uh, Danny was talking to us this morning about his daughter 
and his son-in-law, I think it was Tim. Where's Danny? Is that right, Tim? Is that right? And how he went to all this effort and made this elaborate plan for a proposal. Let me tell you something. That's risk. Because the risk is you go through all this elaborate effort, and then in the end, you still don't know what the answer will be. Now, I'll tell you as a guy that if I get that far that I've gone into all that planning, I'm pretty confident that I know what the answer is going to be, right? But there's always that risk, right? And, and I've, sat, I've sat in those shoes. I've been there and done that. Uh, when, I, when I did I did it at school in front of a whole chapel, there was like 500 people in there, right? And, and I had gone through all this effort and I, and I was there and I was going down to one knee and the professors were holding up the signs in the back for her to see. And I mean, and your heart's going, J -j 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 -j, you know, and I'm used to being in front of people. I felt like I was going to have a heart attack right there. I couldn't do it at this age. I'd just die right there. Okay. And I was sweating and everything, you know, I mean, it was, and, and I held it out there and it was just like, please, Lord. You know, please take it, you know. And I still to this day, I give her a hard time because she never said anything, right? She just covered her mouth and, and gave me a hug. And I'm like, is this a hug that says, I'm so sorry, but no, you know? Or is this a hug that says, yes, you know? I mean, there was no response. There was just tears and hands. And I'm like, ah, you know? But love risks. I mean, you want to talk about the risks of love? You look at what Jesus did for us. He risked everything for us. He put everything on the line. He left all his glory behind in heaven and he became flesh and lived among us. It's the greatest risk that love has ever known. That Jesus loved us so much that he came into this world that he gave himself for us while we were still his enemies. He risked everything for us. He calls us to be a people that are willing to love in such a way that we risk for each other, that we bear one another's burdens, that we love each other, that we love our enemies, that we love those who hate us, that we love those who we disagree with. But as Paul is calling us here to be those who love one another and those who love our neighbor, what is that love going to look like? If your love never costs you anything and there's no risk involved, then I wonder if it's really the kind of love that the Bible calls us to have for each other. So as we think about our lives, as we think about this next year and the efforts that we want to make in the lives of the people around us, and don't be mistaken, church, by the, these ideas of coincidence and things like that, I believe that God puts certain people in our life for us to be a light to them. Amen? That you're going to cross paths with people that you have crossed paths and you will in this next year. That God is putting in your life to give you an opportunity to be a light and to be salt in their world. To be the gospel of Jesus Christ. To make a difference and make an impact. But if the kind of love that you have is not a love that's willing to risk, then those opportunities will pass you by. And so as Paul is talking to us here and encouraging us in the love that we have for one another, and he says all the law can be summed up in this commandment. If you could be the kind of person that could just get this love idea right, then you would have accomplished fulfilling the law. Not keeping the law, but fulfilling the law. It's a powerful thing. It's the culmination of what the Old Testament was trying to to teach us about. The law was intended to teach us about fear and consequence in terms of what happens when you go against the living God. But when we move into the New Testament and we look at the love and the life of Jesus Christ, we see that we're moving from the idea of fear and consequence to the idea of having a conscience that is trained according to the New Testament, to having a relationship with God that is not driven by fear, but that is driven by love and devotion to God. Let's continue on. Verse 11. Beside this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. A simple truth. I mean, it's just a fact, isn't it? Every single one of us in this room are closer today to meeting God than we have ever been any day before now. Okay? It's an important principle. Look at what he says. Go on to verse 12. The night is far gone and the day is at hand, so let us cast off the works of darkness and put on 
the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality or sensuality, but not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and making no provision. And you may also have in your translation, no portion for the flesh to gratify its desires. Knowing all the more as the day draws near, it's time to wake up is what Paul is trying to tell them, to wake from your sleep. There are so many of us that when life gets us down and we get tired, all we want to do is lay down and sleep. Can I get an amen? (laughs) I've only got one kid and all I want to do is sleep, okay? And I know there's number twos coming and that means twice as much I wish I could sleep right now, right? Okay? When we get tired and we get worn down, we just want to be able to rest. But as Paul is writing here, he's writing to the church, he's writing to these Christians, and he's saying, no, the time now is not for sleeping, but the time is to wake up, to be sober, to be alert, to be intentional, to be purposeful in the way that you live your life, because every day draws you closer to the day. Every day draws you closer to the day. And scripture tells us, 1 Thessalonians 5 tells us that when he comes, when Jesus Christ returns, he's going to come like a thief in the night. It tells us that people will be around in the days that Jesus is going to come telling us that peace and security is all around us, that everything is continuing on as the way it has always been in the days of our forefathers. But Paul says it's time to wake up for sleep, from sleep, for salvation is nearer for us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone and the day is at hand. There's several principles he's trying to teach us with this idea of waking up, of being vigilant and intentional. It reminds me of Matthew chapter 25. Do you remember the parable, the story of the 10 virgins? Five of them do not get oil for their lamps, and five of them do. And as the days go on and as they get tired, they begin to sleep, and when the bridegroom comes, they all awaken, and those who are wise light their lamps and go out to meet the bridegroom, and those who are foolish, they they beg for the oil. They say, give us some of your oil that we might have it. And they're refused. And at the end of the parable in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus tells us that it's important to be vigilant because we do not know the day or the hour. It's important for us, first of all, to wake up. But then what Paul goes on to talk about here is the second notion of the importance of cleaning up and specifically cleaning up our lives. To become a holy people, to lay aside the ways of sin and death, He he says in verse 12, to cast off the works of darkness. In Hebrews chapter 12, the writer of Hebrews says that we should lay aside every weight and every encumbrance that so easily entangles us. We have to clean up our lives, purify ourselves, knowing that the day is drawing near, knowing that the day is going to be quickly upon us. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 28, John says, and now little children abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him and be ashamed at his coming. Think about that statement from John. We have two choices of how we're going to be when Jesus comes back. We will either approach him with confidence the same way that the author of Hebrews says we can approach the throne of grace or on that day when Jesus comes back, realizing that we were not awake but asleep, realizing that we did not purify our lives, realizing that we were not intentional about our faith, we will shrink away from the one who has come to bring us home out of shame. He goes on in verse 29, if you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Let me jump down to verse 3. Chapter 3, verse 3. And everyone thus who hopes in him, everyone who puts their hope in Jesus Christ, purifies himself as 
He, meaning Jesus, is pure. We need to wake up, but we also need to clean up our lives. We need to lay aside the sinfulness that's so easy sometimes to let take a dominant place in our lives. That creeps in first into the light that Jesus has brought into our heart as a shadow on the wall, but can quickly become an all-consuming darkness for us. Cast off the works of darkness, but put on the armor of light. In other words, prepare yourselves. Be purposeful. Be intentional. Be awake. Let me drop down to verse 14. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision or give no portion to the flesh to gratify its desires. I love what Paul is teaching here when he says you give no portion to the flesh. Portion control is something I need to learn more about in my life. Okay, let's just be honest. And I love, my daughter has these little plates and it makes sure that you give her everything. It's got a picture of vegetables over here. So you fill that with the vegetables and it's got like the starches. I forget what it calls it. I think it calls it starches and this one other little section. And the protein is the big section. The problem is there's no place for dessert, which is really all she wants. So it ends up, you know, usually that, that protein gets, you know, I mean, she's willing to eat a little bit of protein. It depends, depends on if it's smothered with gravy or not. Okay. I mean, that's, that's what, that's what that depends on. The starches are okay a little bit, but you know, the vegetables just seem to get so neglected. I don't know what it is. (laughs) She takes after me. That's why. Um, But it's hard sometimes. And I, I love this idea of not giving the flesh a portion. In my life, when I look at the way I'm going to live, when I'm being intentional, when I'm setting out what my day is going to be, when I'm setting out what I'm going to strive for in that day or in that week or in that month or in this next year, I should give no portion to the flesh, but give all portions to God. And he comes first. And these other portions, these things that I have to do, you know, the idea, and obviously we're not all preachers, okay, and I get that. But in my work, I need to portion that to God. And when I go to work, I don't become some other person. This isn't time away that I take off from being a Christian, but that portion belongs to God. And so I serve him in my workplace, whatever that job is. My family belongs to God. That portion belongs to God. And so I strive for holiness and righteousness and purity in the way that I deal with my family. The portion belongs to God. Give no portion to the flesh, Paul says in Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 24. And I know Lamentations is a book we all get really excited about when the preacher starts quoting from it, right? But in Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 24, there's a verse that we're all familiar with. And it's what I think of is what my mind goes to when I read this verse. It says, the Lord is my portion, says my soul. And therefore what? Church, help me out. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is my portion. The Lord is what I want. The Lord is what I've been given. The Lord is what my life is all about. And therefore, I will put my hope in in him. Make no room for the flesh. Again, when Jesus was talking and teaching with his disciples, he taught about this woman who takes the opportunity and cleans house and gets rid of the demon, the spirit that was invading that space, but she fills it with nothing. And therefore in that one spirit's place, what happens? Seven return. Give no portion to the flesh, but give all of our portion to God and let him be our portion. Every day, every month, every year is an opportunity for us, church, to seize the day for God. To put him first in our lives. And my prayer for me and for this church, for each and every one of us as a body, but also as individuals, is for us to have eyes that see the opportunities that God puts in our path. For him to give us the kind of love for the lost and for our neighbor that we're willing to risk a hard conversation, that we're willing to risk rejection, that we're willing to risk maybe some 
some slander or we're willing to risk some, some bad mouthing or some talking behind our back to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with somebody. I pray that he gives us eyes that are open and hearts that are courageous enough to do that. That he helps us to be awake and vigilant in our lives, not to take for granted each day that we have, not to take for granted that we need to be spiritual people, but to be intentional and purposeful and to leave no portion, no room for the devil, no room for the flesh, no room for worldly desires, but to give Jesus all of ourselves. Amen, church? What a privilege we have to live in the time that we do. People say, oh, it's a hard time to be a Christian. It's a hard time in our country. It's a hard time this and that. Well, it's a good time to belong to Jesus Christ. And those words have always been true. No matter who is in power, no matter what nation people live in, no matter their poverty or their wealth, there's never been a better time to belong to Jesus Christ, to bear his name, and to be given an opportunity to live out for him than right now today. All of us have an opportunity as we do each week, but in addition to that, as we have opportunity consistently each and every day to come before God, to lay out our hearts to God, to take an opportunity to open our eyes, to lay bare ourselves before him, to be made clean, to be forgiven, to be prayed for, to be emboldened, to be strengthened, even to be saved if we're ready to make that decision in the waters of baptism. I never want anyone to wait another moment to let another day or another hour slip by when their heart is ready to be given to God, when the water is ready for them to be washed in, for them to be clothed in Christ. I never want them to wait a moment longer, but to choose today and now to be made a child of his. Amen. If there's anything we can do for you this morning, I ask that you come forward as we stand and sing.